Um, I want to thank Christian Shumi for inviting me uh, here and for giving me an opportunity to have this dialogue with Paolo. As I was flying here from Philadelphia, I thought it's been 10 years since our last dialogue, uh, which took place at the Ohio State University uh, in Columbus, Ohio, when I invited Paolo in 2006 to have a series of seminars with the students on his work. And so this book that Kristen showed you um, uh, is a result of that collaboration. And it's a pleasure to be able to have this opportunity to continue our conversation. So because of the topic of the conference, I think um, it's uh, appropriate to um, ask the first question um, uh, with regard to the topic bridging the gap. Um, so this conference calls attention to the diversity of Switzerland's cultural and linguistic, linguistic heritage and points to a desire to bridge the gap. Um, as a landscape architect who has worked across borders, has your practice been influenced by or has responded to um, the country's diverse ethnic and um, civic identities? And if so, how? Yes, uh, thank you. Good morning, everybody. And uh, I'm uh, very pleased to be here in uh, Rapperswil together with uh, Raffaella Fabiani Giannetto. And I have to say that she was my brilliant student in Philadelphia on a course. Uh, this, after the third year, I went teach to, um, to Philadelphia. I decided to bring the students outside because since decades they were working always on the same urban fabric. And I said, we have to bring them out. And then I went to Italy and we... we uh, uh, it was the first time, I think I was the first professor to bring the students outside. And then I, uh, traveling, I said, you are crazy, you are a Swiss, you teach in the United States, and you bring the students to Italy. But it was the beginning of a new adventure, so that's where the very early beginning was mm -hmm. with uh, Raffaella Giannetto. Coming back mm -hmm. to the to your uh, question, yes, uh, in fact, uh, ethnic identity and civic identity uh, influence uh, my practice. Uh, and I think uh, since I live in, uh, in the Italian part of Switzerland, uh, in Ticino, the south, I uh, notice always more uh, how this um, division given by the Alps is not only a physical division, but it's also a cultural division. And there is a, a gap between the north and the south. Um, in uh, Ticino, the role, the role of the uh, landscape architect is um, uh, slowly, slowly they start to know that, uh, that we exist. Uh, I have to say that when I graduated here and I went to Ticino, uh, people didn't know what what uh, does a landscape architect. And um, speaking with uh, uh, my uh, colleagues in uh, in uh, uh, in Madrid, uh, um, what's her name now? I lose Carmen Ano Filio. She said that the same thing when she began working. They said, uh, paisajista, but is this a painter? Do you paint? So in Ticino, it was a little bit like this. Uh, now the landscape architect uh, is recognized, but sometimes a very strange uh, situation happened in the sense that uh, in the competition, for instance, a landscape architect is requested. But then in the jury, there is no landscape architect. So it's always an ar architect, group of architects that uh, give their opinion and value the work of a landscape architect. And I believe they can't uh, uh, value as a landscape architect can value. So it happened also in uh, teamwork in groups where uh, it comes from the confederation uh, in teamworks, they ask uh, the presence of a landscape architect, but then uh, the landscape architect has no 
power. So this uh, is also another side of the gap between north and, and south in, uh, in Switzerland. But uh, you asked me also what influenced my practice. I think more than these identities, it's uh, the, the research in my work. Uh, this image that you see here is important to me because um, uh, this is one of the uh, experiences that influenced my work. This is a place close to my, uh, to my house where I live in, uh, outside from Bellinzona. And um, I was al always a rebel. So when I did something wrong, I had to escape. If not, I le beccavo, no? You're punished. Yeah. <laughs> so I used to <clears throat> escape in, in the woods. And I, this was my favorite place. Because here in this uh, ravine that you see the water coming down, here you see a car. So uh, you can't nearly see it, but it's a, a car that the postman leave uh, on the street and the, he forgot to, to take the brake. And when he came back, the car was down, fall down in the, in the river. And to me, this was so fantastic to find uh, this, uh, this object in the, in the river, you know, this decontextualization. And later uh, discovering... Uh, artists uh, like uh, Duchamp, the ready-made, mm. I, I, I discovered uh, the, mm. the energy that is in the theme of decont decontextualization. I took just one <coughs> example. Um, the next question, um, I want to start by mentioning a book that was published recently in 2005. It's called Switzerland, an Urban Portrait. Uh, it was produced by EDH Studio Basel. Um, and in this book, the image of Switzerland that emerges is uh, of a country that is thoroughly urbanized. And it's a very contrasting image to the typical image of Switzerland that is offered to tourists. Um, the objective of the authors who are architects uh, and a geographer in the book is to challenge the planning practices supported by the government, by the uh, federalist government, and their call is for more site-specific strategies. And so for me, reading this book, it seemed like a, um, a call uh, for collaboration across disciplines and among different practitioners. Uh, so my question is, will you agree with their assessment of Switzerland and how do you respond to this call for collaboration? Well, um, in fact, it's true every every intervention that we do is uh, site-specific. Uh, mm -hmm. And um, what is interesting is that it's rarely uh, twice the same. So every, every intervention in the, in the landscape or in the urban fabric is uh, always, uh, always different. This is probably one of the most beautiful and challenging uh, experiences that we can do as landscape architects that we are never called to do twice the same, you know. So often it's a question in the landscape, it's to uh, permit uh, to understand the landscape elements, the, the hills, the lakes, the vineyards, the woods, in a, in a context that is often very much disturbed. So this is probably the first step. How can we re-permit that we are able to read the landscape elements. Mm -hmm. With regard to site specificity, um, uh, reading the book, as I was saying earlier, um, made me think how come there is no landscape architect here involved in, the, in this project? And the research was hailed as very innovative um, and uh, again, I, I thought that the, the call for site-specific projects uh, is not new in landscape architecture. And in fact, uh, 20 years before this study was published um, in the 1990s, Dieter Kienenst, in um, the third thesis of his theoretical 10 points of landscape architecture, stated, and I quote, 
that the old contrast of town and country no longer exists, the boundaries have been blurred, and it is not possible to push back either the city or the countryside. And so his very acute observation is 20 years old, and now it seems to have been rediscovered by other practitioners, other than landscape architects. Um, for Keynes, the solution was to bring back the contrast, uh, to make it even stronger between a rural landscape and an urban landscape. But nowadays, um, there are other theoretical approaches that have been advanced, and other Swiss practitioners, for, for example, Günter Vogt, uh, has described Switzerland as being more urbanized than is usually conceded, but while um, Keynes um, uh, responded by saying that the contrast should be emphasized, the city should be uh, more dense and the countryside less dense, others have accepted this homogeneity um, between the two realms. And so um, studies of the in-between city have been uh, conducted, um, studies in which the um, uh, landscape of proliferated housing has been accepted. Today, we've called it landscape urbanism. So there is a certain acceptance on one hand. On the other hand, there is a, a wish to diversify and uh, go against uh, this merging of the two realities. What is your position? I think uh, both uh, approaches can... Uh can uh, be possible. We spoke about the site specific in the in the landscape before. The question that uh, argue Ken asked in reinforcing the opposition was exactly one uh, one um, uh, theme. Uh, we worked on uh, on um, let me say of, on a research landscape master plan for the city of Rovereto in. Italy, and among the different themes we search on this on this uh, inno innovative uh, master plan uh, was um, exactly this question: How can we reinforce the edge? This uh, blurring uh, uh, perception from the city: How can we intervene against this? And uh, in fact, we propose exactly to reinforce this opposition between landscape and uh, the urban fabric, and uh, in a way that you work exactly on this edge, building, creating uh, parks, avenues, uh, boulevards, and so on, to reinforce this, uh, this uh, condition in a way that, I, that is similar to the specific strategy that you allowed to, to perceive the elements of the city uh, as uh, clear elements that uh, draw the urban fabric. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, now I'm going to ask you a few questions that are more pertinent to your work. Um, so, <clears throat> today's environmental problems, among them climate change and the dwindling of natural resources, have made landscape designers more conscious of their own actions than ever before. Uh, in the 1980s, an awareness of environmental challenges, an awareness that started in the 70s, encouraged the call for the preservation of nature, not only in Switzerland, but in Europe in general. But mere protection is a sign of resignation, or, or so it seems. It, it implies that the loss that we fear has already taken place. What is your position today, and do you think we have reached a point of no return? And do you see the definition of the garden as a symbol of cultural values as now obsolete? Well, this is another interesting question, <laughs> Rafael. You know, the garden as a symbol of cultural values. I think... Uh, uh, in, uh, in fact, if I speak about garden, I say garden, but it's open space, it's park, it's uh, landscape. And I wouldn't uh, use the word uh, symbol uh, that is to me is uh, somehow obsolete, you know. But I think the, the garden has um, uh, always getting more and more important uh, uh, value in our uh, daily life since this uh, uh, everything is so hectic and we are in a time that uh, we can have an answer to everything uh, instantly we just google we have an answer to every question and we start to 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 live and work in a way 
that we lose a certain um, certain possibility for uh, uh, that gives us a, a kind of serenity and i think um, the 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 experience that we can uh, uh, that we can uh, uh, leave if we enter a, a garden a park a site i think is uh, is something very very important and uh, it's exactly the opposite so in if in one way we move in technology in a very fast and uh, and hectic way i think on the other side we need exactly these uh, spaces that give us a, a moment of uh, of uh, silence you know i think uh, like in this this is a small terrace from a private garden i did for a designer he has this house in in ticino and uh, he said that when he is uh, in his house in ticino he spend all the time here on this small place uh, that is in dialogue with uh, mm -hmm. with the wild uh, condition just in front and also this uh, project we we did for uh, in mechtenberg in in germany mm -hmm. is probably something that can help you to mm -hmm. find uh, a little bit another another uh, yourself so it is, it seems to me that it is possible to do both to think about um, nature conservation preservation and seeing the intervention as a cultural uh, product um, so this brings me to my uh, next question your projects are quite well known in Switzerland and beyond um, do you strive for identity uh, that is to use an op another obsolete word a style of your own um, or not not the style, you know, a style is something that if you would make a product and then you you lend this product on the market, you know. I think uh, to me it's something different. I I consider myself as a, an observer and I'm fascinated uh, observation. And there are uh, many uh, observations exactly that... I discovered, um, for instance, uh, themes like uh, how you reach the place, the site, is very important, or the dialogue with the, with the horizon. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is in a small scale, but it's to explain uh, uh, this uh, dialogue. Uh, it's uh, here we are on the islands on the Brisago Islands and uh, there is a place on the Brisago Islands where you have this uh, this uh, uh, promontorio this uh, ending point with the bench with the table and uh, I, I spoke about how you reach the site so here we are in a in a garden and um, as I observed in um, in, uh, for instance, in in Asian countries, in Japan, I walk through a garden and turning right and left and uh, around the trees and so on. And at a certain moment, I I uh, the the path was going up a little bit, and then I you, from there you had a, a different view, and then I saw below me that I just passed in front of this place. But I didn't realize. So I understood that there is a way to move through a site, a place, uh, even an urban fabric, and, uh, and to uh, observe and be influenced of what is around you. So I came to this. This is a one small garden. And here, at a certain moment, you, you have the dialogue uh, from the garden to the islands and to, the, and to that place. It's an invitation to, uh, to think over the physical limit of the property and to, uh, to install a dialogue with the, with the horizon. Mm -hmm. I think other, uh, another theme is uh, uh, also in uh, to have this in the promontory of the 
Cardada project is also the same theme to to install uh, a dialogue with the with the horizon and uh, also in uh, in the geological to to go to sit down to eat something and then they go home and the next time they need another mountain another place and here uh, there was um, a story to tell in this sense uh, it was uh, something about uh, geology and uh, i was fascinated of the the movement of the in geologic time of the european plate and the african plate and then i create this uh, uh, geological observatory that uh, speaks about uh, about this but not in a, in a didactic way if not if uh, in contrary in a way that you discover that you start to be curious about the place about the horizon about the history of the horizon and perhaps you are uh, um, you are uh, interested to know more you know there is a, an image that uh, i found a few years ago in uh, in venice in the uh, uh, art museum and it's uh, from gian domenico tiepolo and I was fascinated because it uh, it uh, contains a little bit the philosophy <laughs> of my work. I don't know if you know this, Gian Domenico do. Tiepolo, mm -hmm. because it's fantastic. Uh, first of all, he put things upside down. So you don't see the people in front, but you see them from behind. And to me, he put mm -hmm. things uh, upside down is a, is a very interesting and powerful beginning and then, for instance, you see that they are looking at something, but you don't know what. So it creates a great curiosity, and, uh, and uh, it don't give answer. The geological observatory don't give you answer. It's an invitation to, to enter into, into a dialogue. And um, another point here is it creates curiosity. You would like to know what are they looking? What is going on behind these people? And um, when I'm fascinated of this uh, painting I discovered only a few years ago, uh, but uh, it contains my, my philosophy, and then I ask myself, how can, we, how can we transmit, how can we bring these uh, ideas also? This is uh, one of my last, uh, nearly last uh, project, it's a small garden um, over the Lago Maggiore and it's, uh, it's an impossible place uh, in the sense that the topography is so, uh, so uh, difficult, you have only rocks and a few trees and you can't enter into this, into this jungle so uh, to me it was really put things upside down means now I want to enter into this place and then we create a path and uh, but not the most easy the most difficult and the path moves uh, between the most important trees cuts the rocks and so on and perhaps it's a little bit that uh, invitation to create uh, a place that invites you to to go and discover i see that there is perhaps not a signature or a style but there is certainly a um, common appro approach that you use in almost all of your projects um, to that is to establish a dialogue with uh, the person who visits the project and allow them to um, read it uh, or give a suggestion with regard to how to read it with a, a number of minimal interventions um, this brings me to my next question there is much similarity as far as I can see, between your design philosophy, uh, which is based on the pursuit of the essential, and Keenest's economy of choice. Keenest argued that, uh, and I quote, it makes a big difference whether I leave out certain elements or the essential spiritual substance, end quote. When the latter is reduced, we can no longer elucidate the design idea. Keenest's design philosophy was rooted in his appreciation of American minimal art. 
where does your stem from, um, your design philosophy? And could this common approach be seen as a Swiss response to modernism, perhaps, bolstered by the country's lack of a historical tradition based on manorial parks and great boulevards that form, form the premises of landscape architecture in other European countries? Well, um, Raffaella, you see uh, where I stand team from where uh, I take my ideas and so. I said before what I call the creative observation, I also talk these arguments to my students trying to, <coughs> to bring them to discover a creative observation. And uh, this is a continuous process. And uh, in this uh, figure that you may see is uh, I saw this uh, last year in Paris on the new Picasso Museum. And uh, I must say that I'm fascinated of the work of this uh, great uh, artist. Uh, and we could speak a lot about, about uh, Picasso. But uh, this, uh, I took this picture because I was fascinated because he begins with a line. And since I'm... Uh, uh, also, to me, essentiality is, is, uh, is very important. But I was looking at that line and I said, it's perfect. It's placed exactly on a, on a very precise place. And it, it has a kind of harmony. It's not in the center, it's not totally right on the top, on the bottom, it's exactly on a place. And I took this picture and then I went home and I tried to to find out, and you can see this, that it's, uh, it's exactly crossing the golden section on the, on the, on, in space. So it means that uh, a surface, a space, it could be a, a plaza, it could be uh, whatever, um, has a, a, a certain... Uh, places, precise uh, points where uh, there is a kind of energy. And the golden section here uh, is, uh, is just perfect. To me, he could stop uh, uh, with that line. To me, it would have been enough. But of course, he, he, uh, he, did, he did much more. That was, but fantastic is the beginning, you know, where you, where you begin and... Uh, and I don't think that Picasso was uh, analyzing this, but at a certain moment, if you, if you work with arts and you, you discover and you search in arts, I think uh, these things come, um, how you say, by itself? It comes by itself. Well, uh, mm -hmm. this is about, uh, I draw also from uh, historical gardens, I mean, in Europe, uh, but also in Asian country, I would say in China, in Korea, in, in, uh, in Japan. Uh, this image here I took uh, in 2003, and it's in Tuscany. It's um, a plantation of uh, uh, populus. Uh, these are very cheap trees they plant to produce wood to produce paper. But if you look, there is a, a very important presence here, and it's uh, evergreen oak, um, Quercus ilex, you know. So oak is very important. And you see it's placed uh, in this point, and if you, you can't walk on this path without be, uh, seeing this tree, and then at a certain moment you have uh, uh, to give a reference and to, to walk around, you know, because it's important. And I was fascinated with this picture. And last year I was invited to give a lecture in Krakowia. And then I found this one. And I say it's, it's exactly the same. So uh, this is uh, perhaps uh, uh, an example how you must not uh, think that... Uh, Certain observations are limited to landscape, to nature, or whatever. It's, it's a question of art. And here the same, it happened exactly the same. You have this uh, uh, church that has the same force 
than the, the Quercus silex we saw before. Yes. Um, I think this theme is, is very interesting and it would be interesting to discuss it in the context of teaching, uh, teaching landscape architecture students. Perhaps we can then go back to this question. Um, you write about the struggle for landscape architects to be taken seriously by other professionals and this is something that has already been brought up today. Landscape architects, it seems, are always anxious to justify their existence and explain how necessary their work is. But do you think this detracts uh, from their own image? Well, um, some decades ago, I went to a meeting of the Swiss Federation of Landscape Architects somewhere here in the German part of Switzerland. And I remember I was... Uh, just a few years after graduating. And I remember that all these colleagues were uh, discussing how we have to protect our profession against uh, other specialists or other figures, architects, engineers, and ecologists, and whatever. And, uh, and uh, I was never, um, I never accepted this uh, opinion that we have to defend or profession, and uh, I, uh, at a certain moment, Dieter Kienast uh, stood up, listening to all these uh, different uh, speakers, and then he said, you know, what we have to do is to work good. And, uh, and it was exactly my philosophy, we have to work good. And uh, this uh, means, uh, work good means, uh, to me, uh, regarding some uh, some uh, questions, for instance, what we call firmitas, you know, how last our work. I'm fascinated from Bomarzo. Bomarzo is a garden that has more than four centuries, and it's still a place where people go and visit. And what is intriguing in this uh, question is. Uh, in this condition is if we can we do something that lasts in time and i when i work in, in uh, when we sketch when we work on the project to me this is a constant question will this last in time or are we doing something that makes a, a, a big noise in the beginning and after a few years has no more er energy mm -hmm. to attract somebody this is one point. Another point is the message that we transmit. And I think we have a big responsibility and we have to take very much care of the message that we transmit with our work. Another point is um, the economic aspect. So certain uh, projects, certain interventions uh, seems to to be useful for a certain aspect, but in fact, they, they, they cost in, uh, in uh, energy and also in financial uh, such an amount that there is no relation to me between the... the this. I, I use with my students, and I love because a student has no limits, and that's correct. It should be like this in the academy. Students should be should keep uh, totally free. But then, when I have some sketches from the students, and I see that they really do too much, and uh, I I ask them, you know, I, I like your proposal, but I must tell you that the government has not that much money. So what do we do? And then I I I, I push the direction to ask them, what would you take away? Or what can you renounce mm -hmm. in your proposal, you know? And this is a way to approach uh, maybe a little bit the question of, uh, of uh, essentiality, you know? The, the, the way to, to tell uh, the landscape. Here is a project in Kreuzlingen, that's the one that is also in the book and this is a way to speak about uh, uh, ecology. And uh, another point is to me, 
the, to find a way to speak about uh, about uh, the landscape. Uh, and uh, in this uh, project we did in Cyprus, this is only one part of an intervention for a cardiochirurgical hospital in Cyprus. And uh, there along the streets you have this uh, Opuntia cactus. And it's probably one of the most common plant that, uh, that you don't notice anymore. Uh, the only thing is that they disturb and you cut them and uh, they are full of dust and so on. But these, these are uh, elements of the landscape. And uh, I think uh, in, this, uh, in this proposal, it's uh, 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 an image that can tell you something about your own landscape, about things that you don't, that you don't notice anymore. Well, um, I think the, we have a few minutes for a couple of more questions. Um, these last questions are about academia teaching and pedagogy. Um, with a few exceptions, Swiss academics have a reputation, uh, according to the Swiss, for engaging in dialogue between themselves, but some have lamented the lack of enough critical debate and have denounced a tendency to shun criticism. As someone who holds appointments at international universities, two different universities in Italy and, and the University of Pennsylvania, what is your take on this, on this criticism? Or this sort of fear of criticism. Yes, um, I I never enter uh, too much in uh, in uh, let me say Swiss debate, and uh, this came like this because I have been invited the first time in the United States, and then uh, I teach in uh, in Italy, so. To me, it's more about uh, the crossroad of these uh, diverse uh, thoughts. Uh, and uh, in my uh, academy uh, experience, I work on the, on the research, on the, on the creative process with my students, in the sense that I, I, uh, I noticed how Everywhere, I mean in the United States, but in Italy, particularly in Italy, perhaps in Venice and so they are the students are very powerful in the research, in, uh, uh, in the conceptual approach. And, uh, but then at a certain moment comes the, the point where you have to jump from the conceptual uh, impressions to the project. Il progetto, no? Mm -hmm. And there, uh, most of the students have the biggest difficulties, you know. So I, I'm fascinated of this uh, uh, moment, like it's, it's like in the, in the Picasso painting, you know. It's, a, it's a, uh, the most difficult how you translate, how you give uh, form to your, uh, to your ideas. And... Uh, in, uh, in this sense, I work very much with the students on the, on the creative process that is much more important to me than the, the, the detail in the, final, in the final results. What are the tools that you use to bridge that gap between the thinking and then the production of, mm -hmm. of the idea? Well... Um, with the students, we listen to music. We look at movies. Uh, I uh, explain them uh, my observation in arts, my uh, observation in the landscape, like you saw this uh, evergreen oak and so on. And uh, uh, for instance, uh, the last course I, I did in the Politecnico University in Milano, the first... Uh, half semester, we worked on the creative process. Of course, it needs to, to find a way to, to do so that the students follow you. And it's not, it's not easy, but it's possible. It should be done in a ludic way. 
So they should understand, first of all, that they are not called to work, but they are there to amuse themselves. And then uh, I choose uh, a few elements from the, from the del quotidiano. So from if, everyday life? From everyday life. For instance, a camp, you know, or the potato peeler, you know, this famous Swiss potato peeler that is ex exhibiting in New York and so on, you know. And uh, the sense is to observe something and to, to, the, to understand that in everything you, you look at, there is a creative potential. So they started to reinterpret the camp. And I tell you, uh, some really did fantastic drawings that could be uh, reinterpreted or uh, part of, uh, of a project, of, uh, of uh, a park or a plaza or whatever. So this is just uh, to, to uh, find the way to give to the students uh, the possibility to amuse themselves. Uh, Picasso said, uh, I, I was born as a, as a child, and then I had to work the whole life to be a child again. Mm -hmm. you know? Wonderful quote. Um, the qualifications required by landscape architects are many and diverse, from design skills to ecological expertise, to technical knowledge, digital parametric modeling, to name a few. The fact that landscape architects are asked to cover such a wide range is both the strength and the weakness of our profession. Is a practitioner in Switzerland considered a specialist or a generalist? And what is the best pedagogical approach, in your opinion? <laughs> Big question also. But um, last uh, few times ago, I read in, um, in Goethe, and I have to say it in German first, and then I will try to translate it in English. In German, it's uh, erst Empfindung, dann Gedanken, erst ins Weite, dann zu Schranken. And it's exactly the philosophy of the project. It means, first of all, it's a question of perception. And, uh, and this is fundamental. This uh, follows all the my philosophy that I work with the students, it's a question of perception. And only afterwards, only after you speak about perception, you can speak about thoughts. Then it's the drawing, then it's the project, and so on. And then he said, erst ins Weite, it means the big scale. It's important that you don't lose your time in any, in any particular details, but you start from a very big scale, Dan zu schranken, afterwards you enter into a smaller uh, task, you know. So this is probably the, it's fantastic that it's, uh, it's so contemporary. No? And um, in, my, in my courses, I, I work in this sense to give them first uh, a feeling for perception and then for thoughts and then the big scale, and then small scale. Mm -hmm. um, I pass out all this is Three more minutes, okay. <laughs> um, so, you studied here at, at Rappersville, and so my uh, final uh, question is more of a comment, or, or actually is more out of curiosity. Um, what was um, uh, what? What did the education here allow you to do once you graduated? Uh, what What did you take from it? How to, and how did you keep building on it? Well, um, here in Rappersville, when we began, it was much different than now. Here you have how so? Can you can you tell us about how different it was? How how perfect everything is. In the beginning, the school was nearly finished, uh, people were working right and left everywhere and we were the first students here and we walk in and all the rooms were perfectly done but empty, you know. And then we walked around and uh, there happened some funny things. The first lesson of physics was fantastic because he spoke about X, Y and Z, the third dimension. 
and we never hear nothing about something like that. And this professor was speaking so fast and so on. Then in the break, we came out and everybody said, we are at the wrong place. That's much too, <laughs> that's much too high. We are terrified, you know. Till finally one broke in the eyes, you know, and he said, do you understood something? I said, no, nothing. I said, no, <laughs> same happened to me. But then it was beautiful in a sense because uh, um, everything was new. So we could, uh, we could experiment also. And uh, I remember it was uh, difficult at that beginning in the first year, there were something like 30% more hours than today. So we had uh, many interesting, we had the meteorology, we had the measurement, we had computer, we had many uh, interesting uh, uh, material. Subject. Subjects, you know. And, uh, and so the, the, it was the, the possibility to, uh, to experiment. And, uh, and uh, uh, like this, uh, then uh, I was al always a little bit an outsider. I, I had difficulty a little bit to, to melt into, uh, let me say, um, a Nordic mentality. And since I'm originally, I'm a Swiss German, but I'm born in Ticino. So I, I can be on the side I like. So I can take the best from both sides if I want to you know. But uh, I, I was a little bit more Mediterranean than the others, you know. Uh, so the only, the only possibility I had to, to breath a little bit Latinity was to take uh, a facultative language and I took as compulsory English and the uh, facultative I took Spanish. And there was a Spanish teacher, she was very brilliant, very, very Latin, you know. And uh, in the beginning the class was, uh, was about 25 or 30. And during the last months they all were working on their uh, uh, diploma work and I was alone with the professor, you know, keeping on doing Spanish. And and uh, but then um, uh, um, I had uh, anyway a very good result. Then uh, I got the first prize as the best student. So I had uh, 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 it was important to me because uh, um, my opinions were always a little bit different than what uh, I had to. Uh, to understand that was teaching to us. And how, how do you, you mentioned it's different today. How, is, how has it changed? Well, um, I think today it's uh, uh, sedimentato, como you say. Oh, uh, it's more static, less dynamic? No, not static. Uh, um, you know, in, in the beginning it was very experimental. Mm. We, had, uh, we had mathematics. And uh, mathematics was very difficult. And then we were terrified for the mathematics exam. And we came in the morning, it was from 8 till 12, four hours. And uh, I was terrified like all the other students. And the only thing was to, to train and train and train. And the last days I was training from a book, one example after the other, for hours and hours and hours. And then I came and... Uh, the, the exam was very difficult and uh, had 1.5. So they went up and then I, at the end I had a 5 in mathematics and the other half a 3.5. And then they said, we don't speak with you anymore, <laughs> my colleagues. But uh, um, later then they invite us, a couple of years later, to, to give our opinions. We had a beautiful uh, director, uh, Fritz Casal. And uh, I must say that when I came, there was an exam. We had to pass an exam to enter the school here. And I didn't pass the exam the first time. And then the whole, the whole summer I studied mathematics. And then at the end, uh, I came to the exam. And... Um, and there was a Zweifelsfall. 
you know, those 3.5. He can study or he cannot study here. And then I came with the professor from mathematics. He was really straight. If you, if you make a mistake somewhere nearly at the end, to him it was a zero. To me it's not a zero because anyway, a certain distance you got. And then the director Casal said, but listen, here it's nearly okay, it's nearly okay. I mean, three and a half is... And so he could begin to study here. And then at the end, I was the best of the class, so things can happen like this. <laughs> <laughs> I think we can thank, thank Paolo uh, for uh, participating in this. And again, thank you for inviting me to... Uh, here to participate. Christian. That was a wonderful dialogue. Thank you both for engaging in it. Thank you.